for being here online and here in person. And uh, for those of you who are online, um, I got a big surprise as a... Um, <laughs> we have a birthday cake. Uh, oh, yes. And, and I'm just thankful they did not put the candles on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Shelley and Thomas and Anna for decorating. And uh, yeah, it's it's actually on on Saturday, but um, I don't have an objection to celebrating early if none of you do either. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what's what's the saying? Uh, life is uh, uncertain. Eat divert. Eat dessert first. So. Yeah. <laughs> So let us begin with a word of prayer, and then um, we will have um, some cake. Let us pray. Gracious and most holy God, we give you thanks for this day and for all the days that are yet to be. I thank you for this journey that we have been on. It has been a joy and a privilege for me to walk with all of you as we've grown in wisdom. We pray that we may feel your spirit moving in our midst even now, and we ask that this time be a blessing unto us, that we may in turn be a blessing unto others, and we pray this to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All righty, so shall we do the, uh, the cake sure. first? Oh, you yes. did brought, you did bring candles. <laughs> <laughs> What's it? Uh, yeah, we have... Um, there's, there's, I know there's one up in uh, the other kitchen, but, um, but there's, there's just, there should be a fork. I mean, a, a nice long knife in this kitchen. Oh, she brought him. A <laughs> girl's coat uh, once, you know. Okay, well, we're all <laughs> prepared then. And um, anyone who um, uh, wants a piece of cake, just let me know. Send me an email, and I'll save you one. <laughs> <laughs> The next half hour is off. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, you just got to email me before it's all gone. So we are looking at the proclamation uh, this evening, and the proclamation is focusing on the Apostle Paul's letters to the various churches. And there's basically a lot of theology in here. A uh, little further down, another upcoming uh, discovery we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's letters in terms of advice, practical suggestions to churches as to how they should handle and deal with different things. As an example, uh, in the Corinthian church, there was a question whether they should eat meat that had been dedicated to an idol that they bought in the marketplace. And Paul's answer basically says, sure, go ahead and eat it. You and I both know that that idol is just a piece of wood or a piece of stone. And so, you know, the fact that it's been dedicated to it, who cares? But then Paul puts a little proviso in there and he says, however, if someone who's new to the faith and knows that, you know, you're an important person in the faith community, sees you eating this meat dedicated to an idol, and they therefore think that the idol is real, then don't do it, you know? And, and Paul basically says, you know, you have freedom in Christ, but do not lead, use your freedom in a way that is detrimental to um, others. So that's the practical letters that we're going to look at in a couple of weeks. This is all the theology of Paul. And I can tell you that um, I very seldom preach on one of Paul's letters because it, it's, it's very, it's much easier to uh, preach on a story where Jesus does a miracle or something like that than to preach on some of Paul's theological letters because He's a rabbi, and they have a very circular way of logic, and they kind of go around and they look at, it, like a, using the image of a diamond, you know, they look at it from every facet and everything, and so it's much harder to preach on a uh, um, letter from Paul. Um, before we begin, uh, I'll launch into everything, uh, anyone have any questions that you want to make sure that we get to this evening? 
this is a really simple question. Okay. They, they talk about Greeks and they talk about they, they talk about the Gentiles and the Greeks. The they Gentiles and the Jews. And no, they say Greeks. Okay. They say Greeks a oh, lot. And okay, yeah. Are the Gentiles Greek also? Well, are they talking yeah. about the Greeks like we know the Greeks? Yeah. So Greek Gentile, I think, are being used interchangeably. Okay. Um, more common to say, yeah, well, I should ask the yes no, expert. That's not the same you said, the same part. Yeah, yeah, is it the same thing or different ones? Yeah. Yep. Um, to an extent, okay. So let me put it this way all Greeks were Gentiles, but not all Gentiles were Greek. Okay, because you have people in Asia Minor and Turkey and whatnot. Uh, so uh, sometimes I think they're used interchangeably and um, it's, it can be a little confusing. Yeah. I've always been more familiar with Gentile and Jews. And in fact, in Paul's letter, I think to the Galatians, he says there is neither, uh, no longer are there Gentiles or Jews. Yep, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, yep, vocabulary, all right. Faith. Under faith, yeah. Faith. So I was reading to, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Yep, that's from the letter to the Hebrews. I think so, I was just a little confused by how is it an assurance of things hoped for? So essentially, what uh, is being said here is first thing that came to mind is the appearance of Jesus to Thomas, okay? And, you know, Thomas says, unless I see the wounds and I put my hand in the wounds, I'm not going to believe. And eight days later, Jesus shows up, makes Thomas wait to let Thomas know he's not in charge. And then he says, um, oh, here we go. <laughs> we, have, we have to pause for this important... <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Anybody want to lay odds on whether I blow them all out? You'll do it. <laughs> Are you kidding? You got this. Keep going. <laughs> oh, wow. That is a beautiful cave. What's that? <laughs> well, so I'm going to tell you a quick story that involves our bingo player. Okay. And <laughs> so when her, I, we'll get back to faith. I promise you. So, so when her daughter, Allison, got married, okay, they, they did the unity candle. And so Nancy and the mother of the groom went up to light the family candles. Okay, the family candles are two side candles, and you have the unity candle. And essentially what the moms do is they take the two family candles and they light them from the altar candles. Okay, and then they put them back. So I'm back too. I'm not seeing what's and, happening and she was nervous and she yeah. said just follow me so That's all of it oh yeah the, the other mother was yeah so this one says just follow my lead and so all of a sudden i see allison with this look i mean it looks we killed <laughs> and 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 all i all i see her is her, her mouth the words mother <laughs> and i'm thinking what's going on behind me well i turn around they lit the candle that the bride and groom was supposed to lit, yeah. <laughs> the <Nice>. marriage candle. <laughs> so the reason why I'm thinking about this is, you know, ministers generally have good lung power. And in fact, I do a stair master, helps. So I said, no problem. So I just walk up there and I'm probably about eight feet away. And I went, and I blew it out. <laughs> I don't think anybody knew. <laughs> But anyways, um, that, that's why I got thinking about that. <laughs> but um, anyway, so Thomas, you know, says, unless I see, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus shows up and he says, here, put your hand there. And Thomas, without even putting his hand in the wound, says, my Lord and my God. 
And Jesus says, do you believe because you have seen? Blessed are those who believe and yet have not seen, okay? And so that's, I think, what's being said here in, in Hebrews is that uh, when you have faith, the more you work on your faith, even though you haven't actually seen the risen Christ, uh, you know, even though, you know, you have no absolute concrete evidence that there is a life to come, that faith and the more you work on it, the more you know that he is real and that there is a life to come. And I will also say that the more you work on your faith, uh, the more you'll see what I now call God winks. Okay, things that happen that some people might say are coincidences, but in your heart, you know that it's more than that. It's pointing to something beyond what we can see and touch. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. God wink. Like a wink. Um, God wink. Um, and I will make a confession. I got that from the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> they, 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 they have a couple of Christmas... Uh, movies uh, about God winks and uh, yep yep all right anything else Rick yeah yes yes hi hi um so under reconcil reconciliation yes yep uh, it says the uh, biblical story tells of the break between God and humanity soon after Christian is that the Adam and Eve and the apple yeah well the forbidden fruit Excuse me, forbidden fruit. <laughs> um, yeah, it's we say apple because we have apples in this part of the world. In Iraq, they have figs and pomegranates and things like that. But um, yes, that's what that's referencing. And as I said, I don't believe that there was literally an Adam and an Eve. I believe that it's a symbolic story that speaks to all of us. I am Adam. You know, we're all Eve. In fact. Adam in Hebrew means the man, okay? And so essentially, uh, yes, this is talking about our fall from grace and how do we get back into, um, uh, um, what's the word I'm trying to say, in, in, um, in tune with God. And in fact, atonement, that's the doctrine of atonement. It's how are you made right with God? And if you take the word atonement and break it into syllables, what you end up with, or what you could potentially end up with is A-T-O-N-E-M-E-N-T, -E -E at one meant. And the Christian faith says that the atonement um, occurs uh, through the life, death, and the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. And I actually want to just go over that a little bit because I did see... Um, uh, yeah, in the 253, the bottom of the page, um, you know, it, it's talking about there were controversies. And, and essentially what you have is you have an emerging faith. And so people are trying to define what this faith is, what it means. And there were all kinds of heresies uh, that uh, were decided that it wasn't in uh, sync with what the Christian story was all about. So, for example, there was a um, uh, heresy, I, I think it was called Menantianism, uh, which basically said, oh, the Old Testament, you know, Jesus replaced that. So they did away with the Old Testament. But it was declared a heresy because, you know, Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill it. And if you abolish the, ten, uh, the Old Testament, what do you do with the Ten Commandments? Uh, there was another one which uh, came up as I was reading one of the um, um, uh, scripture passages, um, and it was known as modalism. And modalism basically said you have God the Creator first, and then you, and then when uh, Christ was born, you have God the Christ, and God the Creator ceases to exist, and then you have God uh, when. The day of Pentecost comes and the Spirit arrives, you have God the Spirit. And so the Christ ceased to exist, and now you have the um, uh, God the Spirit. But, you know, that conflicts with the um, uh, Trinity, okay? Uh, 
another one that uh, is kind of fascinating is um, adoptionism. And adoptionism basically says that uh, Jesus was born fully human and he didn't become fully God until at some point in his ministry, okay? And there were several speculations as to when that might have occurred. Some say that it was at his baptism when it says, um, you know, that the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then there were others who would say that Jesus was adopted by God and became fully divine uh, the transfiguration. Once again, the voice says, you know, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And then some said that it occurred when he was on the cross and he actually fulfilled his mission. Uh, but, um, you know, that was declared a heresy. And uh, we actually affirm this every Christmas Eve when we sing one of our, our song, our Christmas Eve song. In fact, it's, the, it's in Silent Night. Gold star, anyone can figure out where I'm going. Jesus, <laughs> Lord, at thy birth. It's basically saying Jesus was fully God, fully human from uh, the moment he uh, was, was born. And so there were all kinds of the, these heresies. So what's happening is you have the Christian faith emerging and trying to define itself. And Paul goes a long way toward that. Um, if you look at the um, bottom of the first page, you know, it talks about uh, the next to last sentence, words such as sanctification, justification, redemption, and big words, very simple. Um, start with justification, okay? If you justify a margin, you make it, you know, so it's even, okay? Well, theologically, justification has to do with how we put in right relationship with God. And, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. George Oh my goodness, that's a big piece. Well, this is, has your name. Uh, <laughs> now I'm gonna stop passing these around. I'll, I'll do that. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so justification is how we put in right relationship with God. And uh, under the law, it was by following the commandments. And Paul says, no, the law cannot put you in right relationship with God. All the law can do is show you where you come up short, where you fail. And so Paul said that it was uh, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Sanctification. After you've been justified, sanctification is the journey toward becoming increasingly holy. Um, the Methodists call it striving toward perfection. You never get there. And then redemption has to do with the atonement. And um, this is one of the ones that fascinates me. So the early church said, okay, you know, we're put in right relationship with God. Jesus atones for us on the cross. But Okay, what does that actually mean? How did it actually happen? You know, as an example, I can open a hood of a car and say, wow, that's fascinating, but I have no idea what's going on there. Okay, I once had the radiator stolen out of my car, never even knew it was missing. Okay, somebody who works in cars can look at it and say, oh, wow, this is fascinating. You know, so what they did was uh, they came up with all these different theories of, a, of atonement. And the first one, was known as the ransom theory. And the ransom theory said that when Adam and Eve fell from grace, we fell into the clutches of Satan. And so Satan says, hey, you know what? I got all of these people here, you want them? And God says, yeah, I want them. And so God says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you my son if you let all of them out of um, the uh, prison that they're in, spiritual prison. And the devil says, oh, that's great. You know, one son of God is worth all the people in the world. That eventually fell into disfavor for a couple of reasons. One is that it made Satan equal or the devil equal to God. Okay. So God being all powerful, you know, why didn't he just go in and say, too bad, Satan. I don't care whether you want him or not. You know, I'm more powerful than you. They're coming back. 
So it, it made Satan equal to God in some respects. Um, then that was replaced by the, I don't remember the name of it. Uh, no, oh, the redemption theory. And the redemption theory said that, um, you know, God says to Satan, I'll give you my son. I don't have to, but I'll give you my son and you'll let them all go. And so Satan said, that's a great idea. And then on Easter morning, God raises a son from the dead and Satan is left with nothing, okay? And that fell out of his favor because uh, it basically has a God who tricks Satan, you know, a sneaky God. And then that was replaced with the substitutionary atonement theory. And the substitutionary atonement theory says God is just, and we've been bad, and somebody has to pay for that. So God says, Jesus, you go down there, and you die on the cross, and then I'll forgive them all. Okay. Conservative Christians will focus on the substitutionary atonement theory. Okay. Um, I can tell you that when I first started ceremony, I didn't like the substitutionary atonement theory, and I still don't like it because what I remember thinking of, you know, that Jesus guy is a really good guy, but I'm not sure about his old man. And, you know, is it justice to say, you know, you have to suffer for what that person did? Uh, so uh, I've never been a big fan of the uh, substitutionary atonement theory, except for the fact that what you have to do is you have to look at the cross and what happened through the lens of Bethlehem. So what that means is that on the cross, you don't just have this nice guy who raises his hand and says, I'll do it. Okay, I'll, I'll take the punishment. Uh, what you have, remember God, and this is um, uh, Paul again, God was in Christ reconciling the world to God's own self. Okay, so we don't just have a nice guy on the cross. We have the incarnate God. Okay, and that changes things. OK, but I take it a little differently. And I think one of the problems that we get ourselves into is when it comes to the atonement, we start with our sinfulness. OK, and so immediately you're you're feeling bad. Oh, you know, it's awful that this nice guy had to do this horrible death just so I can feel good about myself again. I don't feel good about myself. I feel even more conflicted. So then what I say is instead of starting with our sinfulness, while not denying it, let's start with God and God's grace and God's love. Okay. And on the cross, what we see is the God who is in Christ. And what was the first thing that Jesus said when he spoke from the cross? Spoke seven times, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I paraphrase that to basically say that in that moment, the God who was in Christ came face to face with the worst that human nature has to offer, came face to face with hate, came face to face with fear. He was different, came face to face with pride. The Pharisees were all bent out of shape because people were listening to him and they were the authorities on it, came face to face with greed. Because the straw that broke the camel's back and sent him to that cross was when he overturned the tables of the money changers. That was the final straw. And so he was basically taking money out of the high priest's pocket. So came face to face with all of these things that, frankly, I would say is I see in myself from time to time. And the God who came face to face with all of that basically said in that first word is, just remember this. There isn't anything that you can do that will ever make me stop loving you. And when you realize that, that is atonement, that is salvation. And I think it changes the, the whole dynamics of it. Uh, so having said that, let's move on. Uh, da, 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 da. I, yep. I, I did not realize until I was reading about it. Uh -huh. I really thought of the Torah as being something else. You know, yep. and I didn't realize that the Torah is 
The Old Testament. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. no. First five books. First five books. Mm -hmm. Okay. First five books. I didn't know like that. Mm -hmm. The Torah. It's also sometimes referred to as the five books of Moses or the Pentateuch. Penta five, the five books. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Very good. Uh, yes, sir. Maybe, maybe we'll get to it in the, mm -hmm. in the nations. What's that? Uh, I'm sorry. Galatians. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. So let's, three, let's, let's head over there. Galatians, Galatians. 319 through 47. Right. Is it? Yep. Did I, am I interpreting it right? In what way? That essentially the message I got from that passage was that there's no further need for the law now that Christ has been born. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so what Paul will say is that uh, there's no need for the law in terms of trying to get right with God. Okay, because we can't do it. You know, the illustration I've always used is you're driving down the road and suddenly you see some blue lights flashing in your rear view mirror. So you pull over and uh, the cop gets out, comes up to your car, you roll down the window and he says, you know what? You were doing such a great job driving. I had to stop and compliment you. Okay, that's not going to happen. The law can only show us where we fall short. And that's what Paul is saying. Okay. And now we don't need the law in terms of trying to be in right relationship with God because God has done it. Yep. Uh, and if you want to know the one verse that launched the Protestant Reformation, go to the Romans reading. Romans 1, and it's only two verses, and because it says it all, and Paul says in my translation, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek for it is in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, and I have a note here for the one who by faith is righteous shall live. Um, say again? This is Romans 1, uh, verses 16 and 17. It's the, it's the first reading in the, in the book there. Yep, and so... Essentially, this is the biggest distinction between the Catholic faith and the Protestant faith, okay? And um, I wish I had a piece of paper I could use. Oh, well. Um, so Martin Luther was a priest. And on October 31st, 1517, he went to the cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany, and he put on the door there his 95 theses. These were 95 questions about practices, beliefs in the Catholic Church that he wanted to discuss. And, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll get to this in a second. So, uh, number one on the list was the sale of indulgences. Okay. As many of you probably know, in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, if you did something wrong and uh, you had money, you could go to uh, a priest, or well, not priest, but maybe the, the Pope, and uh, you could get those black marks whited out on your heavenly report card, okay? Because the Catholic Church teaches that Jesus gave Peter the power to bind and loose sins, basically to forgive sins. Uh, Jesus says, you know, Peter, you are a rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and what shall be bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. And so the Catholic Church has the power to forgive sins. And what they did in the Middle Ages is they said, you know how we have the saints in the Catholic Church? Well, and I'm oversimplifying, but essentially they said, these saints have done more than the minimum requirement of good deeds to get into heaven. They were called deeds of supererogation. And what the Pope said is, 
I can take some of those stockpile excess deeds and I can credit them to your heavenly report card, your heavenly account, and wipe that black mark off. And uh, there was a catch. You had to pay for it. And you know, St. Peter's over in Rome? Yes. That was literally built by the sale of indulgences. Mm -hmm. And Martin Luther was horrified by that. And, and, you know, so in the Catholic Church, even today, it's sort of like this. Whoops. F plus W equals S. Faith stand, F stands for faith. W stands for works or good deeds. So those two together bring about salvation. You put in right relationship with God. Now, the problem with that is several, several. Is it faith that comes first and then works or works and then faith? And, you know, is it 50-50 or is it 90-10%? And, and Martin Luther says it doesn't work because anytime you put yourself into the equation for getting in right relationship with God, you're going to go down one of two dead ends. OK, you're going to go down a path that leads to pride. Look at me. God loves me. I, you know, I'm such a good person and I'm glad I'm going there and not down there with all those other lousy people. Or it can lead you on a path of faith that is also a dead land. Only this one is despair. Have I done enough for God to love me? OK, you know, what else do I need to do? And Martin Luther went that route. You know, he would read scripture. He'd get up in the middle of the night to pray. He'd fast. He'd sleep on a stone slab in the dead of winter without, uh, you know, a, a blanket or anything. And he was always left with a feeling, have I done enough? Well, he was reading Paul's letter to the Romans. And in verse 17 of that first chapter, he read the words, the righteous shall live by faith, not by the works, by faith. And so what happened is, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the scales falling from Paul's eyes as he was um, on the road to Damascus. It was sort of like these scales fell from Martin Luther's eyes. And suddenly he, he realized we've got it all wrong. He said, the righteous shall live by faith. And he said, it's 100 percent faith in what God has done for us. And so, let me see. Now, before I show you this, one of the potential flies in the ointment of this is say, oh, well, I've been saved. You know, I don't have to worry about doing all those good deeds. You know, God loves me. Okay. But what Paul would say is that the formula is F equals S equals W. In other words, it's 100% faith. And that is how you know you are in right relationship with God. It's because of what happened on that cross. And that salvation then leads to the good deeds. But there's a difference now. See, over here, you're doing the good deeds to make God love you or try to make God love you. Over here, you're doing the good deeds because you want to express your gratitude and share that love with others. So it totally transforms the nature of those good deeds from trying to earn God's love to basically saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done, you know, for me and, and for all who believe. And so... Uh, that was the verse that led Martin Luther to finally go to the church and uh, cathedral in Wittenberg and post 95 theses in, on, the, on, the, um, on the doors. And as uh, we know, all theological hell broke loose. And the reason why, believe it or not, there were others who had come before Martin Luther who had basically said the same thing. But Martin Luther was the first one to connect it to the sale of indulgences. So essentially what he did was he hit the church in the pocketbook and they said, enough of this, Martin, you're out. And he was excommunicated. And that excommunicated basically means you can no longer come to the table to celebrate the sacrament. Yep. 
So, uh, yes, sir. Okay. I guess that to me, and almost like we have already been before, it's a good idea. That if, if you're able to take some yep. from these saints, yep. you know, then move it down mm -hmm. to you know the person, the highest bidder, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means there's a finite amount of, of yeah. all these things up mm -hmm. here that you can then transfer. Yep. How, how do they know if there's any left? <laughs> <laughs> well, literally, the Catholic Church at one time had thousands of saints. Under John Paul II, they weeded and numbered them out. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I understand your point, you know, as you keep whittling down the stockpile, but look at it this way it makes them more valuable. We've only got X number of uh, deeds of super irrigation left. Get your um, um, indulgence now while they last. You know, right. Yep. All righty. How are we doing here? Uh, oh, here's a not a theological question, but uh, rather, hmm. Never wondered, I never thought of that. How did they decide on the arrangement of Paul's letters in the New Testament? We have the four gospels, which makes sense, they come first. And then you have the Acts of the Apostles, and then you have all of Paul's letters, and then you have some of the letters of you know John and Timothy, uh, not uh, Peter. Okay. So how did they decide on the arrangement of Paul's letters? Not a deep theological reason. What's that? Chronological. No. Good guess. Chronological? No. In fact, Paul's letter to the Romans would probably have been one of the last ones because it was a letter of introduction of Paul saying, I'm on my way to Rome. You know, I want to do some work here. This is who I am. This is what I believe. And this is my theology. Believe it or not, they're arranged by length. Romans is the longest letter that Paul wrote. And Philemon is the shortest letter that he wrote. They're arranged by the length of the letters. Uh, when I was reading yep. all the things here, um, I I love the um, Corinthians 1, 13, that's the love passage, which we hear all the time. In certain Did we have this one to read this time? Yeah. Yeah, mentioned somewhere in here. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, yeah, study the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh, so yes, that was one of the exercises we had to do. Yep. I did, I did extra work. Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. Yep. And it's, but I, I read that verse and I was like, oh, I know what this is. We, we hear this all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's the love chapter. Mm. It's known as the love chapter. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we have this one a couple of weeks when we talk about. Paul's letters and the practical advice that he gave to churches. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote that amazing passage in response to speaking in tongues. And, uh, you know, there are gifts of the Spirit. And if you read the chapter before, he's talking about the Spirit and different gifts and everything. Essentially, what was going on in the Corinthian church is they were using speaking in tongues as a uh, sort of a, a show-off badge. And so they would come together and all these people would be speaking in tongues. Has anyone ever heard someone speak in tongues? No, but you were talking about it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's, it's bizarre. It, it's bizarre. And and so what Paul is basically saying in the lead up to the um, uh, love chapter is knock it off. You're making us all look stupid. And so he would say, you know, when you come together, only one or two can speak in tongues and all, they have to do it in order they can't do it at the same time which is kind of ironic because speaking in tongues is sort of a charismatic thing you have no control over it. and Paul's basically saying do it in order and, and you can only do it if there was someone there who was, had the gift to interpret tongues and so he then after doing all of this he says and I will show you a still more excellent way and that's the words that lead into the love chapter. love chapter 
And what are the first words of that love chapter? If I speak in the tongues oh. of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What he's saying there is, okay, there's the language of, of human language, like we're doing now. And then there's the language of tongues of angels. That's the speaking in tongues. And he says, if I do that, to show, basically he's saying, if I do that and I'm just showing off and I'm not doing it for love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That, that's what that all means right there. Yep. It's probably the most famous of all the passages that Paul wrote. Yeah. Let's look at, did I have it here? Yeah, so the, go to the Galatians 3. Delicious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Galatians. I lost my place here. Yeah, Galatians three nineteen. And over at verse. Oh, yeah, let's start at um, verse 23, and we can all go around and, and read. Uh, we'll go to my left. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, okay? Once again, we're back to justification by faith. Imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So that the law was our custodian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. And we stop right there for a second. What he's saying is, is the law was there... To, to put some limitations on us. What's that? Keep us in line. Yeah, keep us in line. Yep, it wasn't to save, it was just make sure we didn't beat each other's brains out. Yep. Okay, Nick. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a slave looking after us. Uh, we, you know, we no longer, this says, we are no longer under a slave looking after us. Huh. What, which verse is that, Nick? 25. Yeah. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Yours has... You're under a slave. Oh, under slave. In, okay. In, in the previous verse, said so the law was serving as a slave to look after. So oh, interesting. Okay, interesting. Okay. And, and uh, Dave, and verse 26. Through faith, you are all children of God, Christ Jesus. And, yep. For as many of you as were baptized with Christ have put, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek neither slave, nor greater is one male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, there's a great no. And so I think we'll, we'll stop there. And um, so what Paul is saying is that, and you know, here's the other thing too, is, is this eliminates the, oh, look at me, you know, mm -hmm. No one can say, oh, look at me, because Jesus did it all for us on the cross. And so, essentially, it's the great leveler, okay? You know, uh, to use an analogy, um, when we all get to heaven, um, uh, the, the king of England doesn't get automatically to the front of the line, Okay, it's the great equalizer. And so, you know, Paul is saying there's neither male nor free, female. You're all equal in the eyes of, of God. And um, this actually, <clears throat> excuse me, got Paul into a little bit of a conundrum a little later on. Uh, the shortest letter he wrote was the letter to Philemon or Philemon. I've never been sure of how that's um, pronounced. And it's only one chapter long. Anyone know what the uh, uh, situation was that prompted Paul to write this letter? And this is a pastoral epistle, which basically means that Paul didn't write it to a whole church. He wrote it to an individual. And what was the uh, situation that led Paul to write this letter? Uh, 
essentially, a slave ran away from his master. And he shows up at Paul's doorstep and says, here I am. And, you know, I think it's great, Paul, that, you know, you said that there's neither slave nor free in Jesus. So, you know, I'm not a slave anymore. Here I am. Oh. And Paul basically and says, uh-uh, no, 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 you're still a slave. You're equal in the eyes of God, but you're still a slave. That's God's uh, lot for you in, in life. Um, and uh, so Paul sends him back to his uh, owner. But Paul says to the owner, you know, you take care of him and do not mistreat him. This was a book that was used by the South during the Civil War to justify slavery. See, this is part of God's order. You know, Paul sent that, that slave back to his owner. So this must be okay in God's eyes. So, yeah. which also goes to show us that you have to read scripture with the mind that God gave you and to put it into context. And there are some places where Paul will come out and he'll say, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Lord. I'm speaking on my own behalf, you know, here. Uh, he says that... Um, uh, in one of his letters, he says, um, you know, if you can, um, don't get married. Now, why would Paul urge people not to get married? <laughs> I see a couple of raised eyebrows. And actually, to, to put it in a little more context, Paul and many of the Christians back then thought that Jesus was going to return the second coming. And in Greek, it's known as the parousia, that Jesus is going to return in their lifetimes. And Paul is basically saying, if you have a wife and kids and this time of tribulation comes upon you, it's going to be a lot harder for you to be faithful and focus on uh, resisting all of this evil. So he says, if you're not married, don't get married. But then he says, but, you know, if, if you, you can't behave yourself, get married. <laughs> That's what he says. Yep. So. Um, other questions. Talk about the foolish message. Sure. That is, um, that is in, it's in Romans, right? Or is that Corinthians? First Corinthians. Okay, let's go look at that. Uh, oh, yeah. First Corinthians 1, 18 through 31. All righty. First Corinthians 1, 18. All right. So this time we're going to go to my right. <laughs> okay. When we all find it, uh, no, we'll take a second. Yeah. Oh, First okay. Corinthians. First no, no, it's chapter one. Mm -hmm. Verse 18. And well, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. And we're on verse 20. Yep. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the voice of the world? The person in the wisdom of God, the world, the world did not know God. And please God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand science and Greeks seek wisdom. But we proclaim, but we proclaim Christ crucified, stumbling block of Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But for those who have been taught when they are Jews and Greeks, a Christ who is both the power of God and wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay. And so your question, David. Just what does it all mean? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
<clears throat> so one of the things we have to understand is that not everybody said, wow, Paul, this is great news. Thank you for sharing this with us. He met a lot of resistance. Uh, he met resistance in uh, the Jewish community. He met resistance in, in the Gentile community. And uh, the Jews, um, you know, he talks about, um, the word is, is, is uh, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, okay? And, and that's the essence right there is, okay, think about it. Okay, um, if you were to say, and I'm kind of generalizing, my life is so much better because he died. Is that victory? Does that, does that, I mean, that's not the way it works. Okay, so essentially what the Christian message was saying is this Jesus died a horrible, horrible death. And that's a great thing. I'll tell you where I get this. Okay. Um, and almost always they'll ask it in confirmation class. And they'll say, you know, so Jesus was crucified. Why do we call it Good Friday? You know, what's good about this horrible, bloody, painful, ignominious death? What's so good about that? And, and that's essentially what this is getting at, okay? The, 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 the Greeks who are all, uh, the, yeah, the Greeks who are all about, you know, wisdom and learning this thing, that doesn't make any sense. And, and, the, and the Jews were, were basically saying, so you're, you're saying he was divine and he ends up on a cross and he dies, you know, does that make sense? And so they kind of ridicule them. And um, uh, so that's what it means, you know, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block, and you know and and folly and so when it comes to good friday what i always respond with that question is okay what happened to jesus wasn't good but the blessing that comes out of it is is good and so uh paul he fighting an uphill battle at times because uh, people are saying wait a minute you want to you want me to follow and, and put my trust in this guy who died this horrible death and you're gonna you're saying that's a wonderful thing and it's a good thing. It doesn't make any sense to us. It's also why um, in um, uh, some quarters these days, uh, and I see this with seminarians, they will say that the cross couldn't is not a part of God's plan of salvation. Yeah, that's kind of the look I give too. <laughs> and they come at it a slightly different perspective. They basically say that God wouldn't use such a horrible instrument of torture to bring about salvation. Now, the problem is, is that they're not looking at the cross. Remember, I said you have to look at the cross through the lens of Bethlehem. Okay. So, you know, it isn't, you know, God saying, okay, Jesus, go go take one for the team, basically. It's it's God doing this. And, you know, the other argument that I make is that um, no, I lost my train of thought. Uh, God. Shoot. See, this is what happens when you have birthdays. <laughs> so, um, you know, God wouldn't use such a terrible, evil yes. kind of um, thing. And um, so, first of all, I'm on the committee on ministry that oversees the process of, of ordination. And when I was asked to serve on it, I said, you know, I'd be glad to serve on it. But I, oh, I know what I was going to say. It isn't God that caused this to happen. It was human beings that caused this to happen. God just took the evil and transformed it so that grace came out of it. Okay, so God, if it, it wasn't God's plan to say, okay, you go do that. It, God took what we did and transformed it into this grace-filled um, miracle. And so when I went on the committee of ministry, I said, you know, I'll be happy to do, to do this, but I just got to let you know in advance that if anybody comes through 
the process and has this theology that it's called cosmic child abuse. That's one of the words I've heard it. I said, I'm not going to be able to vote to ordain this person. I said, because I still have not had anyone give me a good theological argument that tells me you can take this out of the, the Christian faith. Uh, you know, and and I'm if that's somebody's theology, you know, that I'm going to respect that. But we're ordaining to the Christian ministry. And one of my thoughts is, you know, why not go to the Unitarian Universal Association where that would be, you know, more acceptable. And, you know, one of the other arguments that comes out of this is um, that uh, Jesus suffered passively. And so it encourages women and people to stay in abusive relationships. Okay. And, you know, first of all, my I respond by that saying, um, you know, is... Is, is there any um, sociological evidence to that effect? Okay. Uh, now, I will absolutely say that the Christian faith at times has been used particularly to keep women in abusive relationships. But it's generally Paul's writing that says, uh, the husband is the head of the household just as Christ is the head of the church. And so as a woman, you have to basically defer to him. And I've seen that be used to keep people in abusive relationships. So I don't doubt that at all. Um, but uh, I, I it's, and you know, the other thing I'll say is, okay, if, if what you're saying is true, we've got to get rid of the cross because it encourages people to stay in abusive relationships, then don't we also have to get rid of the Bethlehem story? Because think about it. In the Bethlehem story, we have a young woman who isn't married who gets pregnant. And so does it encourage promiscuity and immorality? And when I bring that argument up, they'll say, oh, it's not the same. Well, it is in my opinion. And here's the other question I'll ask. Uh, did God create the heavens and the earth? Yes. Okay. Then if a loving God who, you know, would never use the cross to bring this salvation about, then why did God create a world in which the mountain lion um, rips out the bunny rabbit's guts? Now, you know, see what I'm saying? You know, why would a loving God create a world in which animals eat each other and, you know, survival of the fittest? Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the things I'll say is Paul's letters here are very theological, but they're very important because they define who we are as um, a people of faith. And it was very important back then to help them say, okay, this is, this is what it means to be a disciple of, of Christ. And, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons why I also say that... Um, uh, pastors need to be in uh, pastors in the local church need to be excuse me the theologian in residence okay because you are the one who needs to be able to understand you know things like atonement and everything like that and convey it to people in ways that are hopefully understandable so that they can can grasp it uh, and by the way, I'm very happy to report that our Minister of Discipleship does not share in the uh, cosmic child abuse the understanding of the cross. What, what uh, is cosmic child abuse? What is that? Because what you have is a God yeah. up there, and you have Jesus down here, the child, the son. Oh. And God's saying, you go on that cross and take a lick at it. Oh. Basically, that's that's what it means. Um, yes, sir? Like not too deep underlying that argument is the the you know the, the debate between you know taking the Bible literally mm -hmm. word for word for mm -hmm. mm -hmm. understanding the message. Yep. yep. <clears throat> so I tell people um the I and you gotta hear the whole thing before you gasp with horror. 
um, I say that the Bible is not the word of God. It contains the word of God, okay? And Martin Luther had a great way of looking at the Bible. And Martin Luther did not take everything literally word for word. And he used the analogy of the stable in Bethlehem. And what he said is, okay, when it comes to the word of God, it's like the stable in Bethlehem. If you look into that stable, you'll see the heavenly Christ child, but surrounded with smelly cattle and cow droppings. And so part of the journey of faith is, okay, what is, uh, you know, the word of God and what is the stuff that has, has created? And we know that human stuff has creeped into the Bible. Uh, give you an example. There's a, one of the prophets in the Old Testament, okay? And so what's happening is the prophet is, is talking about ancient alliances and everything, you know, between this country and that country and everything. And uh, back then, you know, the scriptures were hand copied and apparently they found it so it, it basically in this in, in the bibles we have now it you know goes with all of these um alliances and everything and then in parentheses there's who can understand it okay and so, so that's kind of interesting well they found an ancient manuscript apparently where one of the scribes was reading this and he wrote in the margin, who can understand this? And somebody came along after the wet and wrote it and added it into the um, into the main body. Oh, okay. So, it, and it's isn't agreed by everybody. The actual books were written by man. By man. Ah, right? inspired by God. And so there's one understanding of scripture. It's called the dictation theory. And essentially, it's oversimplifying it, it was that whispered in the ear and said, write this, okay? And there are some who, who believe that. And there are others who don't go that route, but they'll say, um, you know, that this is God's sacred word. So God isn't going to let human stuff creep into God's holy word. God will prevent it, okay? But again, I have questions about that because, you know, there are contradictions, you know, uh, when we're talking about the Gospels. Remember uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus cleanses the temple after he enters in Palm Sunday, and that's the star that broke the camel's back. John's Gospel, Jesus cleanses the temple before he even begins his ministry, so how do you reconcile those two, okay? Well, some people will say, well, you know, it was the Jewish faith was so corrupt that Jesus had to cleanse the temple twice, I suppose, okay? I look at it and I say, well, we know that John's gospel was written last, and we know that a theme through John's gospel is that it was, well, he wrote it most likely in a Christian community that was surrounded by a hostile Jewish community. Because John's gospel is sometimes referred to as the anti-Semitic gospel. And in John's gospel, you'll see words like, the Jews did this, the Jews did that, okay? And so John puts it first to symbolically say that Jesus came to clean up this flawed, Jewish faith, in the same way that, you know, Martin Luther came to clear up, you know, this flawed Catholic faith. Um, so, you know, I don't have a problem with not taking everything literally. Now, the argument that you have to deal with when that is, is what's known as a slippery slope, okay? In other words, you know what, I don't like what's being said here about X, Y, S, Z, you know, that that Jesus didn't say that, or, or the prophets didn't say that. And <clears throat> so I think there is a an objective standard by which you can say, this is the word of God, this is human angst, anger, whatever, creeping in. And essentially, uh, this is the written word, okay? And in John's gospel, we're told that Jesus 
was the word became flesh, okay? And by that, he's meaning the, the, the wisdom and the essence and everything of God uh, became flesh. So this is the, the written word, and Jesus is the incarnate word, okay? And so when I have a passage that I'm thinking, you know, I'm not sure about this. And the classic example I give is Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon there, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. You know, it's written by the Jews when they're in exile. They think that God has abandoned them. It's so amazing. And then it ends with, O Babylon, you devastator, happy shall he be who requites you for what you have done to us. Happy shall he be who takes your little one and dashes their heads against the rock. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the word of God. You know, if you take everything literally, then you need to tell me how that's a good thing. And I resolve that by, I hold that written word up to the incarnate word. And I say to myself, the Jesus I know, can I picture him saying to anyone or encouraging anyone to take a baby and dash his head against a rock? My answer says no. The Jesus who said, let the children come to me isn't going to condone that. The Jesus who said, unless you become as a child, you should not enter the kingdom is not going to condone that. So if there's a discrepancy between the written word and the incarnate word, I'm going to go with the incarnate word every time. So hopefully that helps. And I think we've gone over time and we have. So thank you for your patience, everyone. Ugh.